I'm going to get started because um, we only have 45 minutes, and uh, I gave this presentation before at the Provo Linux Users Group, and it took about an hour, so I'm going to go fast. Um, only ask questions if they're good questions, and, uh, and only if I can answer them quickly. <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, my name is Doran Barton. I'm a developer, and uh, I, it's not an official uh, title, but I like to say I'm a Linux Wrangler at uh, Bluehost. Um, my background is, is both in development and systems, so that kind of gives me um, a somewhat unique perspective uh, when it comes to development and system administration. Um, I'm also the uh, chair of the multimedia committee here at Open West uh, on the core team, which means that I take care of all the uh, video production of the presentations and the keynotes. And as I was just discussing, this is the first year that we're doing live streaming of the keynote, so um, that's kind of a new development for us. Um, we're here to talk about System D. Who here is using a system that's running on System D? Looks like about 70% of us. Okay. Um, let me click on this. It's not working. What you, I thought I had this all set up. Okay, bear with me for a moment. <laughs> the trick with OpenOffice is you have to start it after you've set up multiple displays. Otherwise, it kind of forgets what is where. So we'll start it again. There we go. That's what I want to see. You guys didn't see it, but it changed here. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. System D handles the boot process in Linux. Can you guys even see that from over there? It's kind of a, you can see it okay? All right. Uh, the, <laughs> the boot process in Linux is what is what System D is mostly concerned with. So let's let's review, or for those of you who don't know about the boot process in Linux, let's learn about the boot process in Linux. So the first thing that happens, someone pushes the power button. This has to happen before anything else. Um, the BIOS the built-in input-output system, the basic input-output system, checks the hardware, makes sure you have disks, all that kind of stuff. Um, it hands things off to the master boot record on the disk. The MBR usually loads GRUB, which is the uh, grand unifying bootloader. Uh, GRUB loads the Linux kernel. The kernel starts up a process called init. And init is the first thing that the kernel launches, and so it has the process ID of one. And then init is responsible for pretty much everything else. And that's how it's been since the dinosaurs, the dawn of time. And that has traditionally been governed by system five init. Um, this uh, runs scripts that do tasks or launch programs. Um, these init scripts um, are run in a specific order so that you can say, I need networking before I start Apache because that's a smart thing to do. Um, and then you have these ideas of run levels. And the run levels are basically allow you to package what scripts get run at what time in, in the terms of uh, what type of configuration you're running in. Uh, for example, if you have a system that's uh, a server, you typically don't want a graphical environment booting up, so you just boot up to run level three. But if you have a, a workstation, you want a graphical environment, so you boot up to run level five. And the difference is different scripts get run for that run level. Um, six, is, six and zero are special run levels. One is, six is reboot, and uh, zero is powered off. When, when, I'm, when I'm teaching more basic system administration stuff, People often wonder, why would you want a script that runs in run level zero or run level six? Well, there are things that you want to do when you reboot or when you shut down. So it's not like, I don't want this to run while the computer's powered off. It's the process of powering off that you want something to happen. 
Okay, so what's wrong with System 5 and Ed? It's been around forever. Um, it does the job. Well, that's just it. It's old. And I guess there are some people who are behind System D that just think it's time for something new. But there are some real arguments for something to replace System 5 and Ed. One of the problems is all the services are started serially, one after another. So if, you have, if you're starting a lot of services, you have to wait a long time before your system's up and running. Um, I don't know if this is good or bad, but the argument has been made that because init scripts depend on bash, that's a dependency that could be a problem. Bash isn't the fastest thing in the world. It's the fastest language, so I guess the argument could be made that um, maybe we should have something that does things faster. Um, who's had a problem where Apache crashes and you get a call at 3 in the morning and you're thinking, my, wouldn't it be nice if the server just restarted Apache after it crashed? So init doesn't do anything about services that crash. Um, it doesn't do very well with modern scenarios. Init kind of assumes that everything needs to happen at boot up time. And once it's done running those scripts, your system is in a state that that's a good state. It doesn't expect you to come along and plug in a... Uh, you know, removable storage or a, a, a connect to a wireless network or anything that's going to change. So um, it would be better if, if the NIT was more aware of dynamic things. And then there's the argument that could be made, well, you're a NIT, you're, you're, a NIT, you're, you're running in process ID 1, you can do a lot more than what you're doing. So there, are, there have been many alternatives to a NIT that have been brought up uh, over the history of Unix and Linux. Uh, a very popular one is Upstart, and uh, it kind of got some foothold with uh, some earlier versions of Fedora. Um, uh, Red Hat and CentOS 6 use Upstart, and a lot of people don't even realize that. Uh, Ubuntu has been using it for a while. Google's Chrome OS is, uses it. There's another one called OpenRC that I don't know anything about except that Gentoo uses it. The, the, what's interesting about Upstart is it's very compatible with init, uh, System 5 init. So it's like you don't even know. You're still using bash init scripts, and uh, you didn't even know that you weren't running System 5 init. So let's talk about some of these features of System D. It's compatible with init scripts. So even though it offers a new, better way, uh, you can still throw an, an init script on the system, and it will launch that service just like it used to. Um, this is a big one. Provides aggressive parallelization. Wow, I said that right. I always have a problem with that word. <laughs> um, this is the idea that you, know, you can have multiple services starting in parallel instead of having to wait for one after another. Uh, socket and dbus activation. Uh, this is probably going to be the last thing that I actually talk about in detail in this presentation, but this is the idea that you can actually start up services before the resources are available for them on the system. Weird. But we'll explain how that works. Um, system D takes advantage of a, of a kind of a relatively new feature in the Linux kernel called C groups. Um, so instead of like tracking a process by its process ID. Uh, it can spin up a C group for like all Apache processes. And then when you want to kill the Apache process, you can say, kill everything in this C group. So it gives a little better control of, uh, of things. And plus C groups have a lot of security features. Um, where I work at Bluehost, we leverage C groups quite extensively um, in our shared hosting environment. It's pretty cool, but systemd takes advantage of that. Um, system D is capable of, of maintaining mount and auto mount points. So you're kind of seeing that the, the remove, removable storage issue that we talked about earlier is addressed um, by system D. And then the system D documentation uh, describes this as a feature, elaborate transactional dependency based service control logic. Cool, huh? <laughs> Okay, so System D is, has been adopted quite well already. It's only been out two, three years. Um, uh, it's been in use by Fedora since Fedora 15. I'm running Fedora 21 on here. Actually, it's Corora 
on here. It's a fedora spin with a bunch of extra goodies. Um, Red Hat uh, has, and CentOS 7 has uh, System D. Um, and OpenSUSE, uh, and uh, most recently, Debian and Ubuntu. So last month, um, Ubuntu's 15.04 release. Now, from what I understand, Ubuntu and Debian have had System D available for a couple of years, but um, only just recently has it become the default um, init in the system. So let's talk about some of the new concepts that you need to learn in order to understand systemd. Um, these are units, services, targets, mounts. There's a few others, but these are the, the main ones that I want to talk about. And when you're first looking at systemd, these are the ones that really get your head scratching going because you're like, what, what are these things? Um, let's talk about units. Systemd configuration files are unit configurations. So it's kind of a general way of describing any component within the system D paradigm. Um, the format of these configuration files is everybody's favorite INI format from the Windows world. So um, if, you've, if you've edited one of those, then you know, and you can understand it, then you'll, you'll be okay in system D world. Um, for more information on a system D system, just man system D dot unit, and you'll get uh, a lovely man page all about units. I mention that just because everything is a unit in system D. So don't, nothing intimidating there, but when you're first looking at it, you're like, what is a unit? A unit is anything. Uh, services, of course, are units. Uh, services are unit configurations to manage processes. So you know, service is often, you know, something that you would use in place of a daemon or um, a service, uh, you know, a network service that you would have on a system. These are things like uh, Apache, Samba. These are things that we traditionally think of uh, when we think about init scripts on a, a, a Linux system. What, what is it that they're running? Um, and targets are kind of like run levels. Now, target units are used for grouping other unit configurations. So we talked about how run level three is a group of init scripts that launch services for the system that's not running in graphical mode. So the target is kind of the same idea. It's often interchangeable with run level. Um, we have a multi-user target. Um, it's kind of like run level three, and a graphical target is like run level five. And then we have mounts. Mounts are another type of unit, managing mount points and the mounting of file systems. Now, the one thing that comes up is, you know, in the, the traditionally, um, we look at FS tab on a Linux system to see what what devices get mounted at boot time, um, and that's usually handled by um, an init script. But in this case, uh, uh, System D takes care of all that for us. But it still treats FS tab as authoritative. So if you make a change to FS tab. You don't have to worry about updating any, anything in, in System D to make those changes um, happen on the system. So System D uses a system generator, is what they call it, to convert FS tab entries into mountain units at, at boot time. So you don't need to learn anything new. You can still use FS tab as kind of the grand source of mount information on the system. Any questions so far? Any quick questions with quick answers? Okay, so let's talk about using system D. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, every single one of these use cases will, will compare the old fashioned way, the traditional way of doing these things along with the new way. Um, the system CTL or system control command uh, takes care of a lot of things that you would traditionally do uh, when dealing with an init system. And uh, of course, you know, you're going to be editing some of these uh, unit configuration files. So we'll talk about where they are, what they look like, and so forth. Uh, so one thing that we often want to do is start and stop services on a system. And the way we traditionally do that is with, uh, uh, on a Red Hat system, and more recently, I think on a lot of other systems, there's an uh, SBIN service script. Things like service, Samba, stop or restart or whatever. 
Um, but those really, it's just a wrapper for running the init script that's in etsy init.d. So you would run like sudo service httpd restart. So now, um, it, and I know like on CentOS and, and Red Hat, uh, when you do that now on version 7, um, it's, it's actually calling systemctl for you. Um, so they, I don't know why they did that. They should make you learn the systemd stuff. But um, uh, for those who are, who are still clinging to the bitter end on the, on the system 5 init stuff, uh, the service script is still there, and you can, you can still get by. But anyway, so we have a system CTL. Um, you can see the syntax has changed a little bit. We used to say service, and then the service name, and then an action, like stop, start, restart, status, whatever. Now we have system CTL, an action, and then a service name. Are we okay? mm -hmm. So we, this, you can see we can pretty much do the same thing, system CTL, restart, and then a, a target system. So let's talk about um, getting the status of services that are running or what have you. Um, traditionally, we use the status target of an init script to, uh, to query the status. So if we want to find out, is Apache running? Is Samba running? And uh, usually the, the init script will say, yes, it's running. Here's its PID, whatever. Um, so now we just, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We do a system CTL status and then the name of the service that we want the status for. Um, one thing that's interesting, though, is that system D will give you a lot more information than your init scripts used to do. So um, maybe we should see if we can find a... Let's come over here and... Give a little example here. Um, what have I got running? I think I've got Postgres running here. So we can do a service, a system CTL status PostgreSQL. Now you can see a little bit more information than just that the service is running. Now we also have uh, some information, not only the PID, we have some information about some other processes within the same C group and, um, and a little bit of the log output. So there's a, little bit, there's a lot more information here than uh, System 5 init would provide. Okay? All right, let's go back to uh, here. We get some more status here. There, find out specifically if a, if a service is active. System D really has some, um, you want to find out if a system is enabled. So has it been like check config on or off? And is it active? Is it running or not? So you can say system CTL is active, and that'll we can we can find that out right. We'll go over here and uh, do our little test here. So. It says it's active. So that's good. You know, if you're writing a script, you can you know check the output of that command and see if it's active or not. Um, find out if a uh, system is in the failed state. Has it crashed? You can say is failed. And really, I think both of these are actually the same. They're, they're, they're aliases for each other because uh, if you run is active and the sys service is in a failed state, it's going to say failed. So I, I think that these are pretty much the same thing. But this is very useful in scripting. You want to write a shell script. Yeah, I would imagine that the return code would be different because you don't want... A zero, if you're asking, yeah, yeah, probably. But I think underneath the hood, they're probably doing the same thing. <laughs> so yeah, this is useful in scripting. You want to automate some stuff, get some information from system D, just look at the output of that command. Okay, even more status. Um, you want to find out everything about the system? Just uh, run system D, uh, system CTL without... Uh, service name when you do a status, and uh, you'll get information about everything on the system that system D is controlling. So there you go. It's pretty cool. All right, so let's talk about how you turn things on and off. 
enabling and disabling system, the services. Uh, traditionally, we use check config for this, or on, um, on Debian or Ubuntu. I don't know what you guys use, but you're basically creating symbolic links to, uh, to scripts in Etsy and Etsy. Um, so now we would just do a systemctl enable service name or systemctl disable service name. And all this is really doing behind the scenes is creating symbolic links, but they're to a different place. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, so here's, you can get some information here as well. You can say, is this enabled? It's just like the is active and is failed. It just gives you uh, something that you can use in a script. Um, so let's talk about uh, targets and the default target. On, um, on a s traditional system 5 init Linux system, the way that you control um, the default run level for your system is in the init tab, which is a, a really cryptic file that's not fun. I mean, you always have to like read the man page to find out what it means. But um, what you would usually do is you'd, you'd grep for an init default line in that file uh, to find out what the default run level is. It'll probably be either a three or a five. If you want to have a lot of fun, set it to six. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Okay, so what do we want to do? Well, you type run level at the command line. It'll tell you what run level you're in. Um, now, what you can do is just do a system CTL get default. So let's, let's do that to prove that I, I might know what I'm talking about here. So we do a system CTL get default. And it tells us the target, our default target is the graphical target. So that's kind of makes sense because it's my laptop and anyway. All right, so if you want to change the default target um, on a traditional system five init system, you would go into that init default, I mean the init tab, and you would change that init default line to six. Try it. Um, but now you can say system CTL set default and then you give it the name of the unit configuration file for the target that you want to uh, set the default to. And we'll talk about where you find those files or where you can put those files if you want to create your own. But uh, I'm not going to demonstrate that because I like how my system's working, but you get the idea. So if I wanted my system to run in, in a, you know, boot up into text mode, um, I could change that to, from graphical target to multi-user target. The next time I boot up, it'll boot up into text mode instead of graphical. <coughs> Okay, so querying configuration. You can do a list units command to find out how system is configured. Um, we can do that fairly uh, safely. We don't have to worry about being destructive. So we do a system. Oh, maybe if I spell sudo, right? Okay, so this is telling you uh, all the units that system D is aware of. Now, you'll notice that some of these are basically devices on the system. We're not, talk, we're not going to talk much, I'm not going to talk at all, really, about the, the device handling of system D, because it's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. But just be aware that system D is aware of the devices on your system and, uh, and can do things with them. Uh, but if you come down here, then you start seeing, here are all the services on the system. Uh, there's some colors to say that certain services have failed. Um, I can tell you right now that I know why that one is red, uh, because I plugged in a USB printer up in the, up in the command center last night and, uh, and had trouble getting the driver installed and so forth. So um, that's most likely why that failed. Um, so if we come down, there's more services, uh, lots of services. Uh, we have some slices down here. I don't even know what slices are, um, but it's something else that System D manages. And then we have some targets. We have some sockets. And we'll talk about why sockets are important in, in just a second. And then we have our targets. Um, and so forth. Um, one thing, one complaint that people have about System D is that it's growing beyond the scope of what an init system should do. 
They're saying it, system D is trying to take over the system. It's not going to be Linux anymore. It's going to be a system D distribution. I'll say I think there's a little bit of truth to that. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, system D has done a good job of making, you, you don't have to use every single um, thing that system D can do. For example, system D ships with, a, uh, with its own system logger. So if you don't want to use syslog, you can use their journal program, and it can handle all your logging for you. But you don't have to. You can still use syslog. Um, so, so you can be as much of a system D uh, believer if, uh, it, as, as you want to, is, is my point. OK, back to our presentation. Um, querying, some more configuration querying here. You can do list units. It, it, just, it tells you uh, only the active units. If you do a list units dash dash all, it gives you even more information because this list units just shows you what's active on the system. Um, to list only certain unit types, you can, you can add a type to the system. And, uh, okay. Um, so you can specify the type. So if you want to see what, are the, what, what targets are defined on the system, what services are defined on the system, you can, you can do that just by adding a dash T option. Okay, unit configuration files. This is where they are located on the system. Um, let's skip down to the third one here, the user lib system D system. So this is where um, the system, the distribution installed unit, unit files are located. And then if you want to make some changes, if you want to, um, Say you want to take the Apache unit configuration file and make some changes to it. You wouldn't edit the one that's in user lib system D system. You would make a copy of it in Etsy system D system. Because if you make changes to the one that's in user lib, then the next time you update the Apache package, it's just going to clobber your changes. This way, um, it will look in Etsy systemd uh, first, and then if it doesn't find anything, then it'll go look in the user lib. Um, the run systemd system has like symbolic links to running configuration, so you can see what configuration is actually in use right now. And uh, those uh, unit files are pretty simple in terms of how they're named. It's just the name followed by the type of unit they are. So httpd.service, samba.service, uh, tmp.mount, and graphical.target. Um, let's look at one. Here is an SSHD service file. What you'll notice right away is if you're, if you're used to editing, who likes editing init scripts? It's like you do the same thing over and over. Every init script you write, you have, to, you have to put in this code that starts and stops and restarts and provides a status. And, and if you don't do something, well, you know, that's all right because nobody cares. Um, the point is, is that you have that option. You say, oh, I don't want to provide a status for this. Or I don't want to provide a restart. If somebody wants to restart, they can do a stop and a start right after that. <laughs> But systemd provides a lot of that functionality for you. You don't have to worry about how that's coded. Um, it provides kind of the metadata that describes the service, and then systemd will you know, incorporate the functionality around that metadata. So let's look at this. Um, up here, we have the unit configuration. Uh, we have some information here. There's a, a, a description and uh, a little bit of dependency information that says this needs to run after syslog network audit D. And then we have the information about the service itself. Uh, where does it find its environment? Um, there's some things that we want to run before we actually start the service. Uh, here's how we start the service. Um, this is how we reload the service. This is how systemd should kill the service. And there's some different, different modes here. Kill mode can be control group. If the service is, is managed by system D is a C group. Um, you, can, you can define control group as the kill mode process. You can say none. You don't want, this, you don't want system D to kill the service. Uh, restart on failure. That way, you know, if, if SSH, SSHD crashes, 
System View will automatically restart it, which is handy. Uh, so you can do on success. I'm not really sure why you'd want to restart it on success, but that's an option. On failure, on watchdog, on abort, or always. I've never done that. I'm not really sure what it does. But, um. And then there's this delay. You, you say, I, I want to restart 42 seconds after system D determines that something's wrong. Okay. Um, and then this down here kind of says that this is uh, included or wanted by the, uh, the multi-user target. Now, I'm still a little fuzzy, to be honest with you. I'm still a little fuzzy on how you group uh, units inside targets because it seems like system D has like two or three different ways to do it. One way is, is this. You can say, I want this inside this, um, inside this target. Um, but let's, let's talk about um, how these unit files, uh, let's talk about systemd and how it speeds up the boot process. Little review. When you boot a system with system 5 init, you start a process, start a service, and then you start another one, and then you start another one, and then you start another one, and then you start another one. Eventually, your system's up. But with systemd, you can start a process, but at the same time, you can start this one, and at the same time, you can start this one, at the same time, you can start this one. This kind of goes back to the parallelization. Oh, I did it again, <laughs> that we talked about earlier. Um, and the way that systemd does that is a little puzzling because a lot, for example, sys syslog, uh, a lot of services on the system are going to need syslog before they can start because they need to be able to log. So what systemd does is it says, well, Syslog just creates a socket for you to write, send your log messages to. So system D says, I'll create a socket and just kind of hold on to it till syslog is up and running. And in the meantime, you can write stuff to that socket and uh, we'll take care of it. It'll, it'll, all be, it'll all be good in the end. So let's look at SSHD again in this configuration. So now we have a much shorter um, unit configuration file. So now, oh, this is the SSHD socket. So we're, it's, it's another configura uh, unit configuration just for, for managing the socket. So we're saying this is, this is a socket that listens on port 22 because we all know that's what SSH port is. And, um, and this is uh, um, wanted by a target unit configuration called sockets. Now let's look at the SSHD service. Um, it's a little shorter than what we saw before where we were starting up SS SSHD traditionally but within a unit configuration. Um, this, uh, one thing you'll notice here is, is in instead of starting up SSH as uh, a server that listens by itself for any incoming connection, now system D is doing a per connection server. And some people who have been doing Unix for, I don't know, 20 years, remember this little daemon that used to handle everything internet related called INETD. Anybody remember INETD? Okay, a few of us. So what systemd does is it kind of borrows this functionality that's, that's been around since INETD. INETD would do this. It would, it would say, it would listen on a, on, a, on a port. You would connect to that port. INETD would say, hey, Somebody wants, wants, uh, somebody's giving us a talk request, and they would send that over to the talk server, each connection. And so INETD was handling all the connections and handing them off, spawning a process for each one. And you could see how this could create a lot of processes on your system, on a busy system. But uh, so anyway, uh, systemd is, is doing that by leveraging uh, this INETD um, functionality. And you'll, you'll find out that you'll discover that the... Uh, a lot of the services that systemd manages still have this inetd functionality built into them. Uh, sshd, if you do give it the dash i option, then it assumes that it's being called by inetd, or in this case, systemd, in much the same way. So that kind of concludes. Wow, that was fast. Um, let's let's a ask some questions. I'm not a, a systemd expert, but um, hopefully I can answer. You had a question. I think you had your hand up first. For a number of the programs that I manage, 
I use uh, Supervisor D. Okay. And I'm just kind of wondering, I'm using Supervisor D because the stuff that I'm running would be kind of a pain to daemonize it. Uh, I'm assuming, of course, this can be daemonized things just fine. How does it handle programs that don't daemonize and have standard output that you might care about? Um, I don't know. But I know that I, I have a feeling that because System D includes all this journaling stuff, that it handles it quite gracefully for what it does. Um, does anybody here who's use maybe this aspect of System D? Can anybody answer that question? Does, uh, anytime it starts a daemon, any output from that command, standard out or standard error, it grabs it and then they'll send it over to journal. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. I, uh, in fact, now that you mention it, yeah, pretty much instead of you having to worry about writing to a log file, any standard out, standard error gets, gets written to journal D, which is system D's little log journaling service. Yes. Oh, hang on. There was a question right back in there. Yes. So also a supervisor, um, it seems to me from my very little experience that supervisor and system D solve the same problem where supervisor just kind of sits on top of system in it and system D replaces it. Um, I'm, I'm sure the supervisor and system D can, can coexist and, and work together, but is, is there a reason to still use supervisor with system D, or does system D basically just obsolete supervisor? You know, I don't know anything about supervisor. Today, you know, three minutes ago was the first time I've heard of it. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, if, if, it, if it's compatible with system 5 and it, I would imagine that you would at least be able to run it with system D and then uh, maybe move, migrate stuff over to, to the system D paradigm later. Um, wait, over here? Yeah. So I, I know you mentioned uh, like if, you, if you're adjusting the unit file with something like Apache <coughs> where like you wouldn't want to have your custom unit file uh, removed because of an upgrade. What about uh, like maybe a script or something that you've written yourself that you create a custom unit file for? Is there a best practice place to put it? I just kind of stuck it with all the other unit files so I could use the system control command to like enable, disable. Right, and, and if you put those in Etsy system D, you'd be safe. And you could put them in user lib, and unless somebody comes along with a package with a, system, with a unit file that is the same as yours, you're probably safe from it being clobbered by a package upgrade. But the convention is put it in Etsy system D. Um, that way, that's, that's where anything that's modified or not part of the distribution provided or package provided unit files will go. Okay, back there. In the unit file you brought up for SSH, it had a dollar sign option variable. When do those get set up? What's the process? I think those are uh, set up in the, uh, in the environment file. Like on, on, a, on, on a Red Hat system, you'd put those in like Etsy sysconfig, and that's where it would define these variables like your... Uh, I, I'm drawing a blank right now. But yeah, it, like if you look in Etsy sysconfig, um, PostgreSQL, you'll, you'll see some variables that are set in there that are kind of environment variables for, for that. And options would be, that's where, that's where you'd find those. Okay, anything else? Okay, yes. So you showed how to like globally enable a service. How would you set it up so that, say, for run level three, this is turned off, but for run level five, it's turned on? That's how you would say in... Um, Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. I think that you can do that um, if we look at the man for system CTL. I think you just give it a target parameter when you do an enable. You can specify, I want this enabled for this target. Does anybody verify that? Oh, okay. All right. So yeah, the system, the system D, uh, the system CTL man page, is going to be your answer to that question. But yeah, you can specify. I want it in this, these, these targets. I want this enabled, and these targets I want it disabled. All right. I got a couple more minutes. Any other questions, Curtis? Yeah. What would a, what would disable? 
Damon report for is active and is failed? Uh, say that one more time. What would a, would a disabled da Damon do that's disabled in system CTL? Go answer for is active and is failed. Okay. So let's, uh, we have that one service that we, that we saw when I did the, the list units. And it's this one, the configure printer service. So if we, if we do a system CTL is failed on that, it says failed. And I guess we can do a, no. What is the run level? I mean, the, the return oh, okay. code. But you got to rerun the command. Oh, okay. Give you that output. Then what is it? Dollar question. Dollar question, that's right. So you get a run level. I mean, you get, you get a variable zero for that return code. Um, and then your other question was, and the same thing for is active, would they re would it report anything? It's going to say it's failed. Okay. Cool. So that's kind of why I was saying there. It kind of seems like they're running the same thing behind the scenes. What's your return code? Yeah. What's your return code? Now we get something different. Three. All right. Um, I think that's all the time. I will. Um, make a little pitch here for my other presentation that I'm giving. Uh, it's actually a lot more fun than this one, and it's tomorrow afternoon, and it's the brief history of open source, everything from like the 1950s until now, everything you didn't know. Uh, some of you are quite young. I see some young people in here. Come find out what happened before like 2005. <laughs> and it's, it's a really great presentation. This is the third year I've given it, and that'll be tomorrow afternoon. Thanks.